So a part of, I think, the challenge in Michigan, and given the waiver you have, is what's the leadership imperative to build cultures that have teachers and teacher leaders who can move the conversation forward. What do we talk about? How do we talk about it? What does transform itself means? To change form. So if the data conversations are rich, people will be able to look ideally at practices. And here's the tough one. What should we stop doing as much as what should we start doing in our school? So if it's going to inform the transform, we have to reform. And part of the reform is to reform the way we talk. So one of the, I think, big premises in our work is that the way teachers talk is a direct influence on what happens for kids. Um, Fred Newman and his colleagues over in Wisconsin, uh, his book Authentic Learning says, cultures of collaboration, which are more uh, permeable to influence, can use data. Part of the issue is culture, the higher the degree of teacher autonomy and isolation, the less effective they are. His line is, data bounce off the culture. So data done well gives people a focal point for the conversation, something to build collaboration around. It's the other wor worst case scenario is, oh, it's Thursday, we have team time. What do we do? Well, pe people fill the time with minutia and busy work if they don't have purposeful conversations. I'd say, uh, let's go wander around your school and watch some team meetings and find out what the conversation is. And let's notice that the conversation is really different in high-performing sc high schools and meaning schools that have a high performance trajectory. They're real different than I would call those moving schools versus stuck schools. Uh, I have a colleague in Tucson who has a pretty high challenge school and um, high ELL, high free and reduced lunch. They're top of the state in grade three math every year, number within the top five every year. You get hired into that school, you know that once a week there's data on the table. We're putting the math work on the table and we're talking about it in our teams, not negotiable. So essentially your practice is our practice and that we have to get those doors broken open. What does it mean then to help people learn how to talk and to push people past the discomfort of not knowing? Because that ultimately is one of the tests for psychological safety. It has to be okay not to know. Now, it's not okay to persist in not knowing. Willful ignorance is not an option. But I think the leaders have to be willing to make people uncomfortable, which is not the same as make them, making them fearful. It takes principals who know how to cultivate the leaders on their staff. So for smaller teams, uh, it's not a team unless it knows it's a team. The fact that it's Thursday and we have shared planning time doesn't make us a team. So part of the evolution of that is when the group has a group consciousness, they start to have identity as being a group that does shared work. Affected groups can talk about hard to talk about things in ways that people don't personalize. They know there's a, I guess there's two things. There's relational resiliency, meaning if you ask me a question about my practice, I don't take it as an attack. I assume it's out of curiosity and desire to know more about how I think as a colleague. Uh, the other is uh, they have cognitive resourcefulness, which means they have a set of tools. They don't just take the first answer or the first way a problem is framed because more novice groups will say, well, here's the problem, and people just jump right into the way that's framed as opposed to saying, let's think about this a little harder than that. The backside is once the problem is defined, less skillful groups jump right to the first solution or whoever says it the loudest. So I think one hallmark of good groups is that they are much more deliberate. They can name how they're talking, kind of look at it from different directions, and they also uh, have, I think, uh, patterns of engaging uh, a fuller sense of the group. So it's not just one or two people doing all the talking, all the thinking, all the deciding. One of the things we talk about is comfort with discomfort. 
people are, particularly early on, people are going to squirm a little bit. You're working on building a different kind of culture. And so if the facilitator, him or herself, is not comfortable with people's discomfort, then the group's going to get squirrely. So a good facilitator, so this will not be easy this first time. Let's honor the process. And so people don't slide off the protocols as well. So that's uh, critical. The other is clarity of role, meaning do I keep my mouth shut and draw out from other people or do I put my two cents in? And that'll depend on team size and who that person is to the team. But in general, someone taking a facilitative stance, and this is a mind bender for some people, I can be as useful or more useful to the group by quote, quote unquote behaving neutrally and serving the group by drawing out their thinking than being impulsive and dropping in my own ideas. My own experience is, even when I'm working with uh, closer colleagues, is if I bite my tongue for an extra two minutes, usually someone's going to say what I think is so brilliant that has to pop out. So it's that comfort, that self-discipline in keeping people um, within the process.